Well, as the name near-death experience implies, these people have some event in which they are severely physically compromised. Generally, there's a severe physical malady that occurs very suddenly often or at the end of a chronic illness. Near-death experiences are very frequently associated with cessation of heart function or cessation of breathing function and very often both. And given that 10 seconds after that, that the EEG, a measure of brain electrical activity, goes absolutely flat, it's medically inexplicable that near-death experiencers are having a conscious experience. There's so much more evidence behind something more going on with near-death experiences, something that is not medically explicable. There are blind people, including people that are blind from birth, that have near-death experiences, and for most of them, it's a visual experience. That is absolutely medically inexplicable. These are people that are blind that for the first experience in their life where they've had vision and can see things in the world was during their near-death experience. There is no other explanation for that. Time and time again, we hear accounts of people that had their near-death experience and their consciousness separates from their body. So from a vantage point of their consciousness apart from their body, they're able to see and hear what's going on around them while they're being resuscitated. Uh, very often they can see incredible detail of, this, of the events going on around them. Out of all the near-death experiencers that I've studied that had their consciousness come apart from their body and where they were seeing earthly everyday events, uh, essentially all of them, what they describe, has been absolutely plausible. And of all the near-death experiencers I've seen who actually went and sought out verification of what they saw while their consciousness was apart from the body, uh, every single time, with only one exception, what they saw was as, or heard was absolutely correct. And there is no explanation for that, for consciousness apart from the body at the time you're having a cardiopulmonary arrest. To people that think that near-death experience is not legitimate, I would remind them that there's at least 12 to 15 million Americans that have had near-death experience. This is such an enormous number of a shared experience that so greatly affects their life that no matter what the cause of near-death experience, no matter what your idea is about why it occurs, I think there's no question, given the number of lives that it's impacted, that it makes sense to study it. It's an incredible phenomenon and again, the implications are enormous. A medical practitioner who has experienced this firsthand is Dr. Melvin Morse of Seattle's prestigious Children's Hospital. The near-death experience is, in fact, the dying experience. We will all have this experience when we die. The interpretation of the experience is in dispute. Nevertheless, it's a scientific fact not a belief system that we will have this experience when we die. There have been three major scientific studies of near-death experiences in the last 15 years. And all three of these studies document that these experiences are real and they'll happen to us all when we die. So the old ideas that these experiences are caused by a lack of oxygen to the brain or are hallucinations caused by chaos in the brain at the point of death are caused by the drugs that are given uh, to uh, patients uh, that we resuscitate uh, when we're dying. Those ideas um, were, of course, respectable scientific theories, but turned out to not be true. In fact, near-death experiences are the dying experience. And that's a scientific fact, not an opinion. I think in terms of, yes, certainly in terms of the consistency of the testimonies in near-death experiences, it suggests that the, the experience is a reality which is not purely the product of brain chemicals. Because, I mean, we know from studies of the effects of drugs ordinarily, that if you give one person a drug and then give the same drug to another person, they'll have two completely different experiences. There might be broad similarities, but not the level of consistency you find with a near-death experience. In the past, such occurrences were viewed simply as hallucinations caused by hormones produced by the body during extreme trauma. But experts are not so convinced. Hallucinations tend to be very disordered experiences, and they're nothing like the highly ordered and structured experience that you have with near-death experience. On my website, I specifically asked the question, was the experience dreamlike in any way? And I've actually recently done a formal study of that. Near-death experiencers are emphatic when asked directly, and I did, was the experience dreamlike in any way? The answer is a resounding no. It isn't close at all to a dream. Dreams tend to bounce around a little bit. They don't tend not to have order or structure. 
uh, very often a dream will end without it reaching a logical conclusion in the sequence of events. Not so with near-death experiences. They're highly structured, highly ordered. They tend to have a very logical initial part of the experience. And at the end of a very orderly and structured experience, there's a very orderly and structure end, structured end of the experience. And that's when the experience ends. Near-death experiences are nothing like dreams. If you've had a frightening near-death experience like some of those that I've described, there is no question that when you have that experience, this forces you to look at yourself. This is something that really shakes up your life in a major way. You've really got to sit down with yourself and ask yourself, why did this happen? What's really going on here? Is this the reality? It really forces you to understand what is the reality of what's going to happen when I die. Dr. Richard Kent, a retired medical doctor, has studied the NDE over many years, traveling the world and writing books on the subject. Of the 300 case studies he has made, an alarming amount report the existence of a realm similar to the one encountered by Daniel Ekechukwu. It's just a horrendous, awful place. It's a place where people are terrified, are frightened, um, and people even just who've seen hell, even years later, they recall in horror of what they saw there. Just a place of awfulness. Um, I've interviewed probably over 300 people who've had these experiences, um, and all of them have been dramatically changed. Their lives have been changed by these near-death experiences. You can't say that about hallucinations. Hallucinations simply aren't life-changing experiences, whereas a near-death experiences, um, when you meet Jesus Christ and either see heaven or hell, they are dramatic, riveting, life-changing experiences. And almost invariably, people's lives are dramatically altered as a result of these experiences. So personally, and also because of the fact that the near-death experience accounts are so are remarkably similar, not only to each other, but also to the Bible, I personally believe that these, these are real events and people are describing real events. If you read any newspaper today, you'll talk about, you'll, you'll read about people having a near-death experience of a type, leaving their body and going along a tunnel and, meet, and going to a place of light. It's only one who get, those who get really close to who recognize Jesus Christ. Um, they describe him as nearly six foot tall, but radiating li uh, light, tremendous amount of light coming from him, um, from his face and from his chest and from his arms and from his legs. Um, but people, it isn't just the appearance of Jesus, um, it's the fact that they feel in the presence of so much love. Um, many people said they've never felt They've never felt like that. They've never felt so completely um, surrounded uh, by love, as powerful as that. Some people believe that Chrissy Scubbish loved her son so much that not even death could keep her from safeguarding him. Chrissy's story begins with a dream her aunt had. I dreamed of me sitting in the back seat of a car. It was night, and I could see a silhouette of a little boy standing in a seat and I could see a woman driving and all I could see out of the window was um, just light. Karen says she had dreams before which turned out to be precursors to family misfortune. Though she could not decipher this dream's exact meaning, she knew it did not bode well. Two days later she learned that her niece Chrissy and her little boy Nick were both missing. When she didn't arrive where she was supposed to arrive, I figured, you know, she just changed her mind. So I didn't really get worried about it for a day or two, and then I did. Then I did. An investigation was initiated, but the authorities had little to go on. At one point, a man reported seeing unusual sights on Highway 50, but no one felt it was case-related until later. He had a cellular phone. And he stopped right there and from the spot called 911 because he's seen a woman running backwards and forth on the side of the road there. Meanwhile, Karen's concern for Chrissy grew. I mean, I had no idea if she had been abducted, if she had been in a wreck. I didn't know why she was missing. Karen knew her worrying was only wasting precious time, so she tried to focus her energy on pinpointing her niece's location. When I would um, try to visualize where she could be, I could only see those exits. 
out of Placerville. Though the vision was not clear, Karen's desire to find Chrissy was. So she and her husband, John, set out on an eight hour trek to Placerville, a town not far from where the woman was seen running on the road. At about the same time, Deborah Hoyt and her husband, Nicholas, were leaving Placerville. Like Chrissy, they were driving toward Nevada on Highway 50. Deborah was watching for deer, but instead was shocked by a startling discovery. Lying on the side of the road, she says, was the nude body of a woman. She was really, really white. I kept remembering to myself that she must have been in the cold for a long time to be so white. Horrified by the ghastly discovery, the Hoyts raced to a nearby telephone, where Deborah notified the California Highway Patrol. She stood by and waited for them and went into the CHP vehicle with one of the CHP officers and searched the area. However, they were unable to find anything. They thought it was kind of strange because she was very sincere in what she believed she saw. But what had Deborah seen? Though the officers conducted a thorough search, a body could not be found nor was there evidence that one had ever been there. Was Deborah mistaken? Was there really a nude woman on the road? She was serious and, and believed that's what she'd seen and was still upset when they weren't able to find um, the body which she believed she'd seen. As the officers investigated Deborah's claim, Karen says she had another premonition. I just felt there was gonna be something on the side of the road that would be a belonging, a toy, a ring. I didn't know. If Chris had been there, there was going to be something I was going to find. Karen arrived in Placerville about dawn and notified the sheriff's department that she and her husband planned to search Highway 50 on foot to find whatever that something was. Deputy Strasser was on duty at the time. Seeing the determination in Karen's eyes, he decided it would be best if he accompanied her. Because it was now daylight, Deputy Strasser felt he should follow up on the Deborah Hoyt sighting. He drove to the spot where the nude woman had been reported. When he got there, he didn't find the body. But he did find something that had definitely not been there the night before. Near what we call Bullion Bend, East of Pollock Pines, I found a child's tennis shoe in the roadway. The shoe was Nick's. And further investigation revealed the wreckage of a car. The car was in pretty bad shape. It, it had hit a tree and kind of tumbled a little bit. And I found in the driver's seat, I found a, a white female. It was Chrissy. Unfortunately, she had perished in the crash. I looked over and I saw a young nude boy basically lying in the passenger seat in the fetal position. And I believe both of them were killed as a result of the accident. But Nick was alive, a fact many found amazing because the three and a half year old had been without food or water for over five days. Also during that time, the temperature had ranged from 40 degrees at night to over 100 degrees during the day. Authorities believe Nick had removed his clothing when the heat became too much for him. Suffering from hypothermia and severe dehydration, Nick was rushed to a nearby hospital. The doctor said if Nick had been there another hour, two hours, that he wouldn't have. I mean, Nicky was close to death when he was found. But thanks to Karen's apparent premonition and Deputy Strasser's good police work, Nick was found in time and recovered. But what of the alleged dead woman on the side of the road? Is she owed a debt of gratitude as well? Her presence did bring attention to the site, which in turn brought Nick's rescuers. Some have speculated that what Deborah saw was Chrissy Scubbish's ghost. But Chrissy's family rejects that theory. I don't believe in ghosts, but I do believe in angels. And Chrissy felt very strongly that God appointed to each and every child of his a guardian angel. I mean, she was a strong believer in that. I believe, I feel that it was her or Nikki's guardian angel. Nick's conversations since the accident seemed to confirm his grandmother's belief. When a baby does say things they see, you have to listen. And he did say that he'd seen a naked woman. 
He said there was two. One lady was running on the road. He could see her running back and forth. And he, we asked, where was the other one? And he said she was standing next to the car door by him. Was the naked woman Nick says he saw a guardian angel? If so, why was she so agitated? Nikki was there. Nikki was still alive. God had to draw attention to that area some way. Nick himself has talked of angels visiting him while he waited to be rescued. He has told his grandmother that he's seen, he's seen Jesus' angels and that they're very pretty. And when asked how his shoe mysteriously appeared on the road, Nick gave an unexpected response. I said, did you, did it fall out of the car? And he said, I don't know. And then he said, maybe, his word, maybe, maybe Angel put it there. And I said, maybe, Nikki, maybe. He'll tell you that my mommy died. And you tell him you know. And he said, but I died too. And I was with Jesus. I felt like I was fading away. Next thing I knew, Where? off of the distance, I saw white light. Jim Where? Anderson was dying from a massive heart attack. The only signs of trouble came a year earlier, but his doctor called the symptoms stress-related. Jim was working 12-hour days as a supervisor at a wastewater treatment plant. But this time, Jim knew it was much more than stress. I was uh, resting in my bedroom, and all of a sudden I had a crushing pain in my chest, and uh, the pain radiated down the arm, up the side of the neck, couldn't catch my breath. And I called to my daughter, I said, you're gonna have to get me to the hospital. I'm not gonna make it. A balloon catheter was inserted into his artery. He was stabilized, and placed on a heart transplant list. But two days later, Jim flatlined. I could see everyone rushing into the room, but I couldn't hear the alarms going off. It's like I had gone underwater. The, the hearing had just, just faded away. That's when I began to pray. I knew I was dying. It wasn't a scare praying. It was earnest to take care of my family. As I prayed, it got darker to the point it went black. Next thing I knew, off of this distance, I saw white light. It was beautiful. Just wasn't blinding, but pure, perfect. As I started to go towards the light, I could see the outer edge of it begin to spiral. And I couldn't figure out what that was, but as I got closer, I could see it was the words of prayers revolving. The words broke off going into the light, and I followed into the light. The next thing I felt was being embraced, safe and secure. It felt wonderful. It felt like total love. Next thing I knew, I was looking down the room where my body was. I could see everyone working on me. I could hear what they were saying. There were two nurses outside of the room looking in. One said to the other, why are they working so hard? He's gone. If they do bring him back, he'd be a vegetable. I later on told her what she said. She about passed out. <laughs> then I thought to myself, where's Tabby? And instantly I was in the room where she was. And I've just gotten finished with that prayer. Uh, you know, he's yours, Lord, because I knew that that was the only way he was coming back to us. God wanted him to. When she did that, it's yours. I was in right in on her face. Yours. When I saw her face, I saw every aspect of our life together. From the first day we met, 
our marriage, the birth of our children, all the emotions we've shared. I couldn't leave her. I just couldn't leave her. And I cried out to the Lord. I said, Lord, I love you so much, but please let me go back. I said, my wife needs me. My children need me so much. Please let me go back. The doctors and nurses didn't give up. They shocked Jim so many times that the flesh on his chest was burned. Then the doctors heard a heartbeat. I came back to a world of pain. They shocked me so many times. It's like coming back out of the water. Just, just my hearing came back. I could hear them telling me, I can't believe it, he's back, he's back. I said, can you hear me? <laughs> and I took that first breath on my own. Have you ever tasted honeysuckle? That's exactly what that first breath tasted like. It was so sweet, so wonderful. And I just thanked the Lord. Jim was alive, but his heart still wasn't functioning properly. They put him into a, a coma, a medical, Medicaid coma, and uh, to allow his body to heal. So I wasn't able to talk to him for days. Jim spent the next 17 days in intensive care. He flatlined several more times. And each time, Jesus asked him a question. The subsequent Where? times that I arrested and would go towards the light, he would ask, are you sure this is what you want? And each time I would ask to come back. Jim woke up from his medical-induced coma. His heart increased in function from 5% to 30%. He no longer needed a heart transplant. It was a long process, but basically it was uh, good to hear his voice again. <laughs> Very good to hear his voice again. His doctor implanted a pacemaker in his chest. Just a couple of days later, Jim was able to make it home in time for his daughter's graduation. One doctor told Jim he only had a year to live. That was over seven years ago. It's brought us closer together, so much closer together. Um, we talk about things now, and it, it's whatever needs to be done for the day, it, it's done. You know, we don't, don't focus on things that are trivial. Jim knows that every day he has with his family is a blessing from Jesus Christ. I try to witness to at least one person a day to let them know this isn't about me. It's about their life. And to know that he is there for them. That he loves them. that there was no way to live a completely happy life. And if I couldn't live happy, I didn't want to live at all. It began with a divorce, a broken home. And I believe that through that, my mentality began to form and began to develop a sense of rejection because I didn't understand. I was a small child and didn't understand adult things. And so I, I felt the breakup was all about me. That sense of rejection just really grew. I began to perceive myself as a burden to other people. And so I would take little bitty comments that were relatively insignificant. I would make it into a really big deal. Those little seeds in my life, I began meditating on over and over. And as I grew, the rejection began to grow. What is wrong with me? And so I believe that the only answer for me was to end my life. I walked um, to my mother's room thinking I don't want anyone to see me because I'm so determined to end my life, to end the void, to end the suffering, to end the loneliness, that nothing was going to stop me. I began crying out and I began screaming out to God, God, forgive me. And the gun went off. My lungs began to fill up with blood. My ears, I began to become deaf, very slowly, faintly become deaf. 
my eyes became blind. My eyes were open and I became blinded and I knew that death was gripping my soul. And then all of a sudden, I felt myself, my soul, leave my body and I instantly began falling and falling. And at that moment, I knew I was no longer in control of my destiny. And I ended up in a place that was complete torment. And my body was burning. I no longer was lonely. I was no longer depressed. I became depression. I became loneliness. I became a tormented being of fear. And as I began looking out and I saw all of these other people and everybody was screaming in pain, the, the mutual thing that everyone shared there was their desire to scream out to everybody on earth, do not come here. Acknowledge that life is about Jesus Christ. Eternity is real, and hell is real, and heaven is real, and how you live your life will determine where you go. And everybody cried out that their loved ones would hear the truth. I saw the hand of God literally come down, and at that moment, I knew that He was coming for me, and His hand picked me up, and instantaneously, I was no longer a being of tormented sin. I now was a being being cleansed, and God took me over the heavens. It was beyond peaceful and gorgeous and magnificent. However, I was not allowed to stay, and I was certainly not allowed to see anything specific, but I was able to feel His presence in His entirety. I was able to feel perfect serenity. I was able to feel joy for the first time, complete, whole joy. And this hand just began to bring me back into the universe. And I saw myself coming back to my home and went through the ceiling. And the hand just went and placed me gently back into my physical body. And he went up and I opened my eyes and I saw him go up and instantly, I knew at that moment God loved me. I called out on His name and I asked for Him to forgive me, and He did. And at that moment, I was given a spiritual strength that I had never known. I was given joy that I had never had. I was given peace that I knew would take me through what I was about to face. The bullet had missed my heart um, by less than a fourth of an inch. I mean, just you know, by millimeters there, and had explained that, you know, the pressure of a 38 caliber gun should have exploded my heart. And they didn't understand that there was nothing wrong with me. They had broke a few of my ribs, and that was all. When you leave this earth, you are going to do one or two things. Either you are going to be transformed into a being of sin and torment, or you are going to be transformed into a being of light and love and joy and it is a personal responsibility who and what you are going to be transformed into. And I had to learn how to take on the responsibility and quit blaming others for my mental and emotional condition. Now I'm full of joy. Now I am full of peace. I am who God says I am. I am loved. I am adopted into the kingdom of Christ. You know, God sees me that I am His child and all that He has is mine. I just have to be able to receive it, and I have to be able to recognize and replace my junk with His greatness. As long as I stand on the promises of God and I allow His presence in my life, I can conquer anything and I can go through my problems with peaceful sleep. I can go with them with joy and strength beyond all comprehension, and I can come out on the other side full of hope and a victory in Christ. I was told he was involved in a motor accident at Onisha. When I examined him, I looked at the chest. There were no respiratory movements. 
and listened with the stethoscope. There were no breath sounds. I tried to look at the heart, the cardiovascular system. There were no heart sounds, and the patient had no pulse. I looked at the eyes. The pupils were fixed and dilated. I just made an impression right away that the patient was dead, and he should be removed to the mortuary. I don't know what to do again. My, my heart ran out of me. I was shouting. When they brought him in here, he was being brought by a father and a wife. Then there's no life in him, no heartbeat, no any kind of any sign of uh, weakness. They accepted him as a dead, as a corpse. Then after all those, I checked all around the body and everywhere is so stiff. That was what gave us the strength to start our procedure. When I sent him in to the second room, the last uh, slab. The mortuary man took our name. We gave him 1,000 naira to continue his work. I began to call upon the name of the Lord. I began to remind God of his promises. And number one, this year, God told me in Isaiah 61 that I shall not experience any violence in my home again, that I shall be called the city of the Lord. So when anything that happens, I will hold God on that word. I say, this is one of the violence. It has come again. And you promised me that I will not experience them again. Why this one? So that is always motivate me to hold God firm so that that violence will disappear from my way. And uh, this, uh, another verse that always appears to me is Hebrew 11.35. Women receive their dead bodies to life. So the moment I read this place, it always put force in me to hold God and act. So that night, when I remembered all these things, I said, no, it cannot happen. I must do something to prove God again. On Saturday, while we were sleeping in the night, the wife of my son, for I took him to the mortuary. He said, the woman said that the husband is disturbing her, that they should carry her to Anisha for Reverend Bucky. After some time, my, my father-in-law considered them both of us. He, he went to them and planned with them. Before I could come, they have already put my husband inside the gasket, and I was with my first son, Victor. So when we reached, I hide the child somewhere so that he will not see the father, because as he questioning me, where is my daddy? I told him, your daddy is in the village. When we reached the village, he asked me, where is his daddy? I told him, he's in Tunisia. So I was deceiving the little boy and he was crying. So the moment they put him inside the ambulance, they pushed me. I ran inside the car, with the front side, with my son and with his brother. So we started coming down to this place. When we reached at the GRA, I saw somebody, I asked them, do you know if Bonke has come? Bonke was here on the second day of December 2001 to commission the Kingdom Life World Evangelism, which is the evangelistic arm of this great ministry. We put out the advert, we even invited people to come that is going to pray for the sick, and is going to pray for the Onisha people. Then we are on the platform around 1 p.m. Bonke was preaching. Suddenly somebody came to me and they told me that they brought a man with an ambulance, a coffin. Both of us we were sitting together at the same place inside the church. Before an usher quickly ran in and told us there's an emergency, they are trying to bring in a corpse into the church. And we have to run down from the fourth floor down to this place. And coming down here, we met an ambulance car. Already a pastor has already ordered them to go up. And, I, and we told the ambulance people to come down here. And I told them, first of all, go and bring the man's wife. I would like to talk with her first. And they now brought her over. And we are just down there at the shade. I was asking her what actually happened. I felt that the anointing will be so high here, that the anointing will resurrect my husband. That was what I felt before coming down here. Both of us, we consulted together. I told him that it would be a very big embarrassment bringing a corpse inside the church. And what do we do 
that wherever we are, that God is, that if God wants to perform a miracle for the man, the place where the man is does not really matter. Then the security men, because we have security men from the state government and the federal government, the SS people, the mobile police unit, they were there, they ordered the ambulance to stop and demanded that they will open the casket to make sure that they didn't bring in bomb, telling people that he's a dead person. When they looked at him, it was a coffin, it was a dead person. They ordered them to close the casket. Then that was the time our local <laughs> security men told them to move away with the coffin. Then the wife started crying and said, I believe that he's going to come back to life, I believe. When she started crying, and they were arguing. Some people said, bring him down. Some people said, no. Then some of my people will bring it down. Other people will push it back. Some people, will, and they were dragging. Until my son went there and told them to carry him to the basement and to get him out of the coffin that they should not carry it with the coffin into the basement because the children will be scared and people will run away. First of all, they should remove him from the casket, which some other boys helped us do. They removed him from the casket down there, just at this plane now. And they have, we have, quickly have to run inside, this, um, um, inside the youth conference center. We are looking for a place to lay him and they brought in these two tables and his head was here while his legs were here. This was the first day where they now laid in. Then we go to the meeting. Bonke finished. He prayed for people. After praying for the people, I took him to the office. Somebody rushed in and said, "It's now breathing. That is breathing. Is breathing." Now he has started um, breathing, bit by bit. That we should pray. So I and my pastor friend, Pastor Luke Ibekwe, we started praying. But when I touched him from the head to the toe, it was like a stock fish. So as we were praying now, suddenly we saw the eyes started, the life started coming in, and we put the hands on the, heart, on the chest. Now, the neck, I massaged the neck, and life came into it. I was able to turn it, but before it was like a stock fish, I was able to turn it. I picked up the mic and asked the whole people that that dead man they brought here is now breathing. And the father interrupted my announcement and said, although he's breathing, his body is still like iron. Suddenly, people shouted for me to turn to see why people are shouting because they were all there, filled up all this place. They want to see. And when they shouted, I saw this man jumped up. When he jumped up, I abandoned the person I was with. And I rushed and I grabbed him just like this. When he started breathing, suddenly he jumped up. One of the men in deliverance grabbed him. Then he looked around. Then they decided to carry him up because people were jamming into the place. Then he asked for his fire, his fire, his fire. I find out that if we keep him here, people may trample upon us. I said, let us take him upstairs. And we follow through the step, staircase there. And we, up, we go at the edge of the step. He said, water, water. He demanded for water. I was shouting, bring water, bring water. Let's give him water. And uh, as they were delaying, he was asking me, my file, my file, my file. And I said, that is the file the enemy is using to accuse you. Just kill it, you will, you will understand. As we carried him to the pastor, priest office under the, uh, under the farm, we keep him there, and the fan was rolling. He was still asking, where is my fire? When the two angels took me off, so we came to a place that they now handed me over to an angel, one of them. So that one now took me to a place. He told me, that we are going to visit paradise. That was what he told me. Because I was communicating with him as human being, everything you can. I asked him questions, he answered my questions. He was holding me like a friend. So he now told me that we're going to visit paradise. So we now visited a place. When we, when we approached the place, I saw multitude of people that look 
exactly like the one with me, that angel with me. The angel with me was having the white apparel. The body was pure white. The apparel was pure white. But the, the, the apparel doesn't look removable from the body. So, and when I saw this crowd, they were looking exactly like the one with me. So in my heart, I say, oh, look at where the angels gathered. That was what I thought, because I was still having thought in me there. So now he told me that this is where the saints that had died, this is where they are. So while I watched them, they were singing praises and so wonderfully, you know, it was as if there was a force inside that environment that controls what they do. When they want to raise their hand, they raise it at once. No one will be faster, no one will be late. If they want to bow down, they will just go down. Wow, no one will be faster, no one will be late. As if there's a force controlling them doing other things. Was hearing a lot of musical instruments, but I never see anyone. So while that experience was going on, in my spirit, I, I, I desired it most to go in there to join them. I even made a move. He said, no, I still have a lot of things to show you. Don't go in. So after that, he now said, let us go and visit the mansion Jesus promised. Are you getting what I'm saying? He now took me to a, a wonderful place. In fact, what I saw there, I, I don't have anything to describe it. It was so glorious. Very wonderful mansion. You look at the building, it will look like glass, look like gold, look like whatever. You, the, the, even the, the flowers there, we are looking like gold. So, you know, when I was looking at that place, he now told me that Jesus has finished the mansions, but the saints are not ready. He now said, now let us visit hell. That, that was the last uh, district. Now, now, that's one thing that happens. From the paradise, whatever he says, we appear to the place. We never fly, we never move. Immediately he said, let us visit the mansion. In a twinkle of an eye, I just found a place that looked like that mansion. So from that mansion, he now said, let us visit hell. In a twinkle of an eye, we found ourselves the place. So immediately we approached the place. That gate was so big, so large. They wrote on top of it, welcome to the gate of hell. As soon as we got to the place, the angel just raised his hand like this, waved it down, and the gate opened with a wonderful noise. So immediately the noise, the, 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 the gate opened. I started hearing lamentations. So I now looked inside. I saw people like us here. They were having the same, they were putting on some clothes, the same flesh, some are black, some are white. They just looked like us outside what I saw in the other side. So they were shouting, there was a lot of pains, a lot of torment, to the extent that immediately that gate was open. It was as if they were seeing me. And I don't even think that they were seeing the angel with me because I was standing with the angel because they never asked the angel to help them. They was asking me for help, shouting. And I remembered one wonderful one because I'm a pastor. So that one touched me so much. He was shouting that I'm a pastor. I only ate church money that I'm ready to refund. Immediately he just wanted to say, I'm ready to refund it, that I should help. That force that we are tormenting, I never see any fire there. I never see any flame here. But the, the, the torment there looks as if people, that they are inside fire. All these things the angel was telling me, I was writing them down in a file. The angel gave me a file and a pen. I was jotting all of them down. Even when I walk here, I remember, that was the first thing I remember, that file. I asked them, where, where is my file? They couldn't understand me. So all those things I saw, I jotted them down. But it was later I realized that the file might be my memories and all that. So while I was shouting, asking him for help, he said, that he, I have another chance to go back. He mentioned this, that the request of the rich man in hell had been granted to this generation. I didn't understand it. It was now that I woke up, I read the Bible, I, I realized that the request was, the, the rich man was requesting that a dead man should be sent back to the world. So he just said that the request of the rich man had been granted to this generation for the last warning. He said to me that, that he's given me opportunity to go back for the last warning to this generation. All practice is a stressful environment, and you're dealing with a lot of very difficult situations. I used to wake up with a knot in my stomach every morning, feeling that stress. He just was burdened 
by work. I mean, it was always on his mind. You know, it was, it was a hard thing for him to turn off on the weekends or, or to get away from it. I was just focused so intently on my career that I was letting what's really important fall by the wayside. Jeffrey Thompson's law practice didn't take just his time and energy. The fast pace and the constant stress also took a toll on his body. I maintained that stress and it continued to work on me and it also continued to work on my body. And eventually it broke down. I began having stomach pains, severe stomach pains that, that I initially, I just had no idea what it was. I thought I had an appendix rupture. Jeffrey had developed diverticulitis, a painful condition that attacks the intestinal wall. Months of natural treatments had failed, and his condition had become so advanced he needed surgery to remove part of his intestine. But what looked like a textbook operation left him suspended between life and death. And I woke up to a surgeon pulling a sheet off of my stomach. And as I looked down, I knew immediately something was terribly wrong. And then I looked into the surgeon's eyes, and I could see concern on his face. He had been hemorrhaging for almost 24 hours. And they had continually given him blood, but it was hemorrhaging into his abdomen, and they didn't know it, into his stomach. It was frightening. I've never seen anyone so, so pale, but his his lips were just completely white. My internal clock told me that I was getting ready to die and I only had a few seconds of consciousness left. I reached up to grab my wife. I was just wanting to tell her how much I loved her and tell her that I was getting ready to leave her. And, and I went to him and it was right after that I lost him. You know, I could tell he, he left. And he, he took my hand and then he was gone. And my life came to my center torso and I began to rise out of my body up into that room. Everything was going haywire down below me. They were saying, I'm going to lose him. They were doing everything they knew to, to keep him alive at that point. It, it looked like it was a disaster going on, but it was the sweetest day of my life. I never had any pain, and I never had any fear. As Jeffrey's spirit hovered above his body, a light appeared. It was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. It started in the center of the room toward the ceiling and began to filter out into that room, and I was immediately drawn to it. And as it began to hit objects in that room, color came flooding out like I've never seen before. My senses became enhanced. I could see everything in that room with perfect clarity. There was an entire dimension that we just simply don't see on Earth. I've never been more alive than I was at that moment. It was incredible. I suddenly had an overwhelming sense of God's presence, of His love, of His peace, of His joy. The thing that was just so incredible to me is how the maker of this universe, who can make the sun, the moon, and the stars in this earth and us, can come down and hold me and comfort me and love me as if I'm the only person in the universe. And I remember thinking about the prodigal son. That's what came to mind for me, that long lost son that had gone out and strayed and he had come back home. And his father was coming out to hold him and to love him and to welcome him back. That's what was happening to me. It's the sweetest love there is. I told him I wanted to go with him. And then I had a fleeting thought. But what about Madeline, my wife, and what about Will? My sweet wife. It's just falling apart down below me, and I'd never seen her that way. And I'm up here in complete comfort, in complete peace, in complete joy. And then God told me internally I was going to go back. And I remember jolting in my bed, and I opened my eyes. And when I opened my eyes, I'm looking at the surgeon, and he's saying, I'm losing him. We've got to get him back in surgery. Jeffrey was rushed back into surgery where doctors stopped the bleeding. When he finally regained consciousness, Jeffrey had a new understanding of God's amazing love and presence in his life. God loves you more than you've ever known. He knows your circumstances. He, he, he knows what you're going through. I used to wake up with a knot in my stomach. I wake up with joy in my heart. 
I know he's with me. You can't go through something like that and not be a changed man. He has a peace about him. He's a very, a very peaceful and very centered. He's really not fearful of anything now. Jeffrey's recovery was long and difficult, but the peace, joy, and love of God he found on the day he faced death is now with him in everything he does. There's a peace and a love there like uh, I can't describe to you. And, and it's, it's an entirely different way of living. I've never enjoyed living more, and, and I understand now what's really important. I want to live for God, and I pray that he'll give me the opportunity to continue to do that. <coughs> I had been sick for about two weeks, which felt like the flu, and I thought to myself, well, I've got to get to a doctor and just get some antibiotics. I just hadn't taken the time to do it. Yvonne Sklar didn't have the flu. She had pneumonia, and it was getting worse. And I realized that my breathing was so shallow that I couldn't hear it. And I said, what's going on, Lord? And he said to me, trust me. Then Yvonne collapsed. She was taken to Loma Linda University Medical Center, where Dr. Takin Lowe discovered the severity of her illness. Out of the six lobes in her lung, four of them were actually involved in the pneumonia. Tests revealed that the infection had spread into her bloodstream, and Yvonne was going into septic shock. Dr. Lowe told her she would need to be intubated and put into a medically induced coma so they could treat the infection. But Yvonne was resistant. I didn't think I would ever wake up. And I kept telling him, I've had a really good life, and I know where I'm going, and it's OK just to let me go. She and I had a very heart-to-heart -heart talk. We pray with each other. And then I look into our eyes and I told Yvonne, look at me. This will be the last person you get to see before you wake up the next time. Meanwhile, Chaplain Donna Herrick, Yvonne's supervisor and friend, rallied people to pray. I took the lead in that and gathered my students. So every day someone could go and pray with her. We gathered as her family. Then Yvonne's organs began to fail. She coded three times over the next two weeks. For each of the organs that fail, there is associated approximately 20% chance of dying. So her lungs fail, her heart fail, her kidneys fail, and her endocrine system, which is the blood sugar, was going out of control. So at that moment, she had approximately 70 to 80% chance of dying. Since Yvonne had no family present, her friends met with doctors to consider turning off her life support. As a longtime chaplain, Donna had seen this many times before. When you are on a respirator like that, day after day after day, this is not something you recover from. You don't expect that. I had prepared myself that she was not going to survive. Later, Donna felt God told her to go to her friend's side. She didn't appear to be with me, but she wasn't gone either. And I took her hand and I said to her, Yvonne, I love you and it's okay. If you want to stay where you are, go on to stay with the Lord, it is absolutely okay. I will miss you. We will miss you. It's okay. Donna didn't know that at the time, Yvonne was already in heaven. I remember when I left my body that I was in a beautiful, beautiful field. The flowers were so vibrant and alive. There are no words to describe what it's like to be in the presence of Jesus, the love and the light and the purity. The love is unsurmountable. It is all-consuming. The music was more beautiful than any tabernacle choir, any orchestra. It sounds like hundreds of thousands of people praising God. There isn't even an inkling of any other emotion than happy. Yvonne says they walked through heaven. And he told me, 
I tell you in my word, to ask for all things small and large. And people don't either feel worthy, or they feel like they're bothering them, or it's too much to ask, or that they don't believe in, in Christ or heaven. And he says, but remember to tell people, ask. Then Jesus told her she had to go back and asked her to deliver a message. I want you to tell people everything that I've showed you. I want you to tell them about my love, my forgiveness, and that they can come as they are. I want them to repent with a sincere heart and follow my laws. Then three days before she was scheduled to be taken off life support, Yvonne woke up. What was so amazing about that was just the shift of going from death to life. I mean, you know, you know, just intubated, pale, uh, just the things that happen to human body when they're intubated that long. Just there's no life and, you know, and then to walk in the room. I mean, now she's not up doing dances, but she was Yvonne. But very quickly, she progressed to a regular room, and then she was gone to rehab. It was, it was amazing, amazing. Coming back was bittersweet. First of all, you're in this body again, which is very cumbersome, and it's very limiting. In heaven, there's no limitation. And I was talking about heaven as soon as they put a little device on my throat. While Yvonne's recovery was long and difficult, she bounced back, and Dr. Lowe is astounded by her progress. Yvonne is a miracle. Normally, it's very hard for a patient like her to have such a miraculous recovery, and to the point where she can go back to the community at large and kind of contribute um, actively. Later, she married Rick, one of the faithful friends who prayed for her recovery. Yvonne believes that she was brought back for a very special reason. I think that my entire mission on earth is to share what happened to me in heaven, how much his love is and this forgiveness and what it's like there. I don't even have enough words or adjectives to describe it. It's just a place that I'm looking forward to going back to and I want as many people to go with me as possible. Tony Davis was a young rhythm and blues singer who followed the path of many aspiring musicians. I moved from Orlando, Florida to Los Angeles seeking to sing R&B. Tony's dreams of stardom just weren't coming true, so he turned to God for help. I went to praying right there. I said, something got to happen. I know, God, if you're real, please help me. Help me get out of this. I gave my life to Christ right there. I changed my life around. And I said, you know what? I want to start singing for the Lord. I want to do gospel. Tony started a new career as a gospel singer. He thought his life was back on track. That is, until the night he went to pick up his wife. I came just to pick up my wife from work. And when I pulled up to the house where she worked, bullets started to ring out from behind me. The first bullet hit my left leg, my thigh area. And I turned to run. And as I turned to run, two more bullets followed and hit, hit my leg again. And I ran and I fell down beside my car. And all of a sudden, another young man came from the other side, the front side, and he started to shoot me all over again. A bullet hit my right side thigh area. Another bullet hit the ground and came up through my leg. All of a sudden, the bullet went across my face, my chest. And I said, enough, in the name of Jesus. And a young man was standing behind a tree. And he had the gun pointing towards my head. And I said, why? What have I done to make you shoot me like this? You don't even know me. What have I done? And his hand began to tremble, and he lowered the gun. At that point, I knew I was going to die. It was too much blood. One of the bullets shattered Tony's main artery. He bled to death right there on the street. His wife, Criselda, ran outside when the shooting stopped. When I went there, he was, um, he was laid out shot in his blood. I actually saw myself that the ambulance was giving him CPR and inside. I asked to go with him and they would not take me because they was doing CPR to try to bring him back. I started to float towards these clouds. 
um, these clouds open up and through these clouds I saw this huge city um, it was so strange but the city was beautiful man it was, I saw these colors I've never seen before in my life these strange just glowing colors radiant colors just glooming out of, of this huge city all of a sudden this voice said it's not yet your time go back and I'm like no 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 way he said my name Tony your work is not yet done go back the doctor had already pronounced him dead I opened my eyes and I looked up and I was on life support this thing was in my throat this long tube with a trait was in my throat and this doctor was standing over me and he was about to throw his sheet over my head but he dropped the sheet and he ran out the room doctors and nurses ran to his room they was checking me and they couldn't believe they said you know you, you was dead for 30 minutes and usually when you you know after a few minutes of death you you know they expected me to have brain damage tony was alive but the doctor had some disappointing news for him and the doctor was telling me we sorry but we had to cut your throat immediately to try to get air into your body so we cut your throat and we mistakenly cut a piece of your vocal cord so what we can do at this point is um, hmm, we can put a box on the side of your throat and you can talk through this box. And they told him they may have to amputate his left leg. And unfortunately, the artery put in your left leg is not working properly. It's not sitting right in the leg. I was mad with God because I asked God, why did he let something like this happen to a good person that's trying to serve him? But Tony says he held on to his faith in God. I've served God in spirit and in truth, and in, in, in that I believe that he's going to show up and heal me. I believe that Jesus said by his stripes we are healed. That's in the Bible. And I believe that he's going to heal me, and I'm going to stand on that only. Tony prayed for a miracle and says he got it that very night. And all of a sudden I felt this warmthness come into that room. It came into the room, a, war, a, a nice warmness. And it touched my leg. And I felt it go up to the artery. And I felt like stuff was being mingled together in my leg. And all of a sudden it went up to my throat. Tony says that while God healed his body, he was also working on his heart. You must forgive is what God said in my spirit. And I'm like, no, you gotta be kidding me. Why should I forgive those guys that shot me like this? And he said again, you must forgive. And when he said that, I said, you know what? This is a choice for me. I'm going to forgive. It's not a feeling, but it's a choice. So therefore, I forgive. Police told Tony he was probably the victim of a local gang initiation. I really strongly believe in my heart that it was a miracle because the way that my husband was shot, it's, I, I see that people come in the hospital when he was in there with one bullet in their, their body, they died. He had five bullets and he never, he didn't, he died, but God brought him back for a reason. Tony is still singing gospel and says that wherever he goes, he wants people to understand the power of God's love. I know and I truly believe when the scripture says that not even death can separate us from his love. I think about how he touched me and brought me back to life, how he gave me my joy back and my strength back and my faithfulness to him it just i mean i'm just totally overwhelmed with his grace and his mercy how old are you today me and what is your name and where do you live Nebraska. who's your mommy Sonia. who's your daddy Daddy, Who's your sister? Cassie. That was eight years ago. Looking at Colton now, you would have never guessed that he almost died in 2003. His father, Todd, tells about Colton's near-death experience in the book, Heaven is for Real. And he started throwing up into the toilet, you know, and uh, at first we're like, okay, he's got the stomach flu because the doctor said it was going around. Colton's condition only got worse as days passed. His doctor discovered his appendix had burst and infection was spreading in his body. Time was running out. 
And we knew we were in bad shape when they, they say, well, you need to come out to the hallway. They separated us from everyone else. And then someone came to us and started talking to us that uh, we got to have surgery on your kid. It was tough. Um, seeing your boy be lifeless when he was a very vibrant child. And it was at that moment that we were looking at each other. I remember my wife holding Colton in that hallway, just us. He's not even moving. We went to the surgery prep area, and I remember them hauling him away and him just yelling at me, Daddy, don't let him take me. Daddy, don't let him take me. And I went back to the, uh, uh, the pre-op room where we had left some stuff. And I was finally alone, shut the door. And I just broke down, and I was mad at God. I just frustrated, fed up. And I remember telling him, I said, God, after all I've done for you, and now you're going to take my kid? This is how you treat your pastors. And I was calling our prayer chain. I was calling anybody that would be on the other line to get Colton on the prayer chain because it was bad. We were there in the waiting room for an hour and a half, maybe. Then I remember the nurse coming out. Uh, is Colton's daddy out here? I'm like, yeah, well, Colton's up, uh, up in recovery and he's screaming for you. And I'm sitting there with him. And I remember my son in that room then looking up at me and goes, Dad, do you know I almost died? And my first thought was, maybe you overheard the nurse say that, or maybe they thought he was under anesthesia, you know, and, and he wasn't. But it wasn't until four months after we got out of the hospital that we finally listened to our son. And that's where I got to see heaven. No, Jesus and some angels came and flew me up to heaven. And I said, so Colton, what did Jesus look like? I knew that the first person I saw was Jesus. He was wearing white robes with a purple sash, and he just came down nicely and gracefully. Well, Dad, Jesus has markers. Dad, Jesus has markers. I didn't know what he meant, so I finally asked the right question. Colton, where are Jesus' markers? And he drops his toys down, and he stands up, and he just points, Dad, they were right here. He takes his fingers, points to the palms, then he bends over and touches the tops of his feet. And looks up to me, that's where Jesus' markers were, Dad. When I was in the throne room of God to start with, so I got to see what that looked like. I was upset because I didn't know what was happening. What God did is he used people that, people or things that I liked to calm me down. From there on, I felt better. Then one day we're traveling together and he looks up at me and, Dad, you used to have a grandpa named Pop, didn't you? I'm like, yeah, he's really nice. Really? Yeah, you used to play with him as a kid and fix, work with him on the farm and, and shoot stuff with him. I'm like, yeah, how do you know that? Well, he told me. A figure came up and he was Pop. He asked me, are you Todd's son? I said, yes. He said that he was his grandpa. So that's where I met him. Yeah, Pop, uh, I was very close to him. And he was my most significant male role model when I was a kid growing up. Kid, but he was killed in a car wreck before I turned seven. Um, I was busy paying bills again, because um, that's um, my job. And he came up and told me he had two sisters. Well, he had to say it several times before he finally got my attention. And finally, I put myself down and looked at him and says, what do you mean you have two si sisters? No, I have two sisters. You had a baby die in your tummy. And I just looked at him like, well, how do you know you have two sisters? Well, she told me. And then he proceeded to describe her. She looked like Cassie, but she had brown hair. And first time when she saw me, she just came up and hugged me. We knew this was true, because he said, she kept hugging me. She wouldn't stop hugging me, Mom, and I didn't like that. Well, I'm not really the hugging type. I had miscarried the weekend of Father's Day weekend, which made it even rougher. And we thought we'd dealt with it. We got over, we accepted that the baby had died. But when he said he had two sisters, I was, I think I was in shock first and then trying to realize, what is he telling me? And so I knew that he had seen her and after he described her, and he said, she's just, she just waiting for you guys to come to heaven. You know, as we talked about heaven and he was telling me all these wonderful details, I just felt like I had to ask him, did he want to come back? I knew that I was leaving heaven because Jesus came to me and said, Colton, you need to go back. Even though I didn't want to go back, he said that he was answering my dad's prayer. 
And I remember that prayer, that irreverent, that disrespectful, screaming at God prayer. <laughs> I was like, he's answering that prayer? Today, Colton is a healthy 11-year-old and shares his heavenly journey with boldness. I learned that heaven is for real and you're gonna like it. Bruce Van Natta loved trucks, and his job as a self-employed diesel mechanic helped this Christian family man live out his power truck dreams and provide for his wife and four children. He never gave a second thought to the dangers of working on engines that weighed thousands of pounds until November 16, 2006. I was working on a Peterbilt logging truck about an hour from our home, and the guy that I was working with that day, the driver of the truck, asked me if I would look and try and diagnose one more problem, one more leak before I left. So if you can picture one of these great big Peterbilt trucks, here's the front bumper. And I slipped underneath that great big chrome bumper feet first. And he had had the front axle jacked up in the air and the passenger side wheel removed. The axle is going right across my chest at this point, maybe an inch or two above my chest. Then just as Bruce slipped under the truck, the 20 ton capacity jack holding up the truck shot out from its position and this 10,000, 12,000 pounds of weight that is on these two front wheels on this axle came down across my midsection, basically like a blunt guillotine, and just crushed me in half. Blood had splatted the inside of my throat, the back of my throat when it fell, and I could see that there was less than an inch of airspace between the bottom of the axle and the cement. So I knew that I was thinner than it, my body was thinner than an inch. The man jacked the truck up off of me. I begged him to get me out from underneath the truck. He didn't want to because he could tell that I had to have a broken back, and I did. Um, my vertebrae and my back were cracked uh, the width of the axle. It was the most incredible pain you can think of. I've never felt any kind of pain like that. The very next thing it is, I just called out, Lord, help me. I called out twice, Lord, help me. Instantly, all of the pain left Bruce's body. At that point, my, I went unconscious. My spirit left my body floated up into the ceiling and now I'm, my spirit is looking down on the accident scene from above. The man I've been working with was on his knees above my body. He's talking, I can hear him talking, he's saying things like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But on each side of him, also on their knees, was a huge angel. Their heads stuck up at least this much taller than his head. So if you would have stood them up, they would have had to been like eight feet tall. They did not have wings. They were just very broad shoulders again. Between the two angels and him, it took up the whole front of this truck. There was a bright light shining around each one of them. They were matching bookends. They looked identical. They just had their arms underneath the truck, not holding the truck up, but had their arms angled in towards my body. There was no pain. In fact, just peace. And I can't even describe, words can't describe the peace that I felt in the ceiling. Bruce knew he had a serious choice to make. I was definitely on the point, on the verge of life and death. There were two voices, thoughts in my head. One was, shut your eyes, give up and die, and you're just gonna go to heaven anyway. It was very loud. There was another voice in my head, thought, much quieter, more of a whisper, and that one said, if you wanna live, you're gonna have to fight, and it's gonna be a hard fight. And next thing I knew, my spirit went back down into my body like that, just like a shot. Bruce was conscious as he was flown on a life flight to the hospital. Doctors there doubted he would even survive the next few hours. His ribs were broken, his pancreas and spleen crushed, and several major arteries had been severed. I had five major places, five places that major arteries were completely severed. I found out from uh, doctors that there was a medical study done in 2001. According to that study by the University of Southern California, they've used my case and compared it against that study. And according to that, they can't find anyone else in the world that's ever lived with five major arteries being severed. So I should have bled to death in just a few minutes. So my thought is the angels were there to hold my, somehow hold me together. Bruce stayed in the hospital for over two months and survived five major surgeries. Yet he had overwhelming obstacles to overcome. Almost 75% of his small intestines were crushed in the accident and had to be removed. Adult has 18 to 20 some feet of small intestine, they say, roughly. Somebody came in and told us, they didn't expect me to live much more than a year. I'm going to starve to death. I was losing weight very rapidly. They're feeding me intravenously. Bruce's once 180-pound frame dropped to 126 pounds. But Bruce's family was praying, and his community rallied around him. 
Then Bruce received an unexpected visitor in his hospital room one day. The Lord woke up a man in New York two days in a row, someone that I met one time on vacation. And he came and prayed for me in the hospital, put his palm on my forehead, and when he prayed, uh, he prayed the way Jesus taught us to pray, and he spoke to the mountain, in this case, my intestine. And he said, small intestine, I command you to supernaturally grow back in length in the name of Jesus Christ. And when he did, it felt like 220 volts came out of his palm into my forehead, right into my body, and I could feel my intestines moving around and going up and down. After a long nine months of surgeries and hospital stays, Bruce was eventually able to feed himself, and he gained weight all the way up to 170 pounds. When he returned for testing, radiology reports and doctors confirmed that he had almost nine feet of small intestine. His intestines had doubled in length. When they test me, uh, they say that the intestines the Lord gave me back were twice as good as normal. Even though I don't have my full amount, he gave me several feet back. Even though it's half as much, they absorb the vitamins, the minerals, the nutrients that I eat into my body normally. Over and over, the Lord kept confounding the doctors from the from the point of them saying that I shouldn't have lived, I should have bled to death, to my intestines miraculously, intestines miraculously coming back. Over and over, uh, God was showing that miracles are happening. My pancreas rejuvenated by itself, my spleen rejuvenated by itself. Miracle after miracle after miracle, God just kept showing up and showing himself very real and strong that he is the miracle worker. Today, through their organization, Sweetbread Ministries, Bruce and his family travel together to talk about supernatural healing. Bruce has also written a book called Saved by Angels. Miracle after miracle after miracle. It's exciting to just see what God is doing in people's lives today and that he is alive and well and he wants to reach people at their point of need. And so we've got a God that loves us more than we can ever imagine. And he pours out his love on us in such an amazing way that it's undescribable.